I want to welcome everyone. Wish you, as far as man's new year goes, of course it's not God's new year, but everything we seem to involve ourselves within the world that God tells us to come out, wishes us a happy new year. I wanted to talk about a subject today. I want to put things in perspective as far as the year ahead and the years ahead until Christ returns. You listen to the news, and according to who you listen to on the news, we're doing pretty good in the society. Uh, stock market's on a tear. Uh, if, you, if you've watched the stock, in the month of December, it rose so many percent. What are some other things that's on a tear, too? It is, it's affecting our lives. And I want to talk about it today because, you know, the Bible tells us to watch, and that's what we're doing. And I want to talk about a sermon today. <coughs> I don't know if you've ever uh, seen this before or heard this before. It's called the normalcy bias. Normal, normalcy or normal, normal, normalcy. And I think it's pronounced normalcy because there's no I in the I-C-Y, bias. And what that's telling us is like, it can't happen here, or the denial of reality. Now, I'm listening to the news people out there, and they're telling us how much better we really are than we were a couple years ago. And I look at that, and, I, and I'm wondering, like, why am I getting such conflicting stories, though? Because not only do we watch the news, you should also do, like we said a couple years ago, follow the money. Because if you follow the money... It tells you a entirely different picture than what the news people are telling us. So I'm going to talk about where we're going from here in news, because I haven't done this kind of a sermon, and I'm going to guess maybe a year and a half, about the economics. So bear with me on some of the economics, and I'm going to put into play why I believe what's going to happen in the next year or so, how important that's going to be to fulfill prophecy in the years coming. And I'm going to go through that today. It's going to be a two-part sermon. I'll do today. Now, next week, uh, I'll be in, in uh, Georgia where we'll be doing a, a, a local church workshop or a leadership meeting. And in two weeks here in New Orleans, we'll have the ministers in town. And so we'll, we'll set up something special for lunch. And hopefully everybody can get here and just try to bring as many people as you can bring in. And they'll be doing their, their, their messages here while they're in town. And then in, in the third week, we'll come back and we'll do part two to this sermon. Because it's really important, I believe, to what we're going through and we're going to face that's affecting our lives. That most people in the United States are going to look at and they're going to say, oh, that can't happen here. We've been through this before. We'll get out of it. In fact, I get newsletters via email and it comes into my mail from many economic forecasters. And many of them are predicting the doom that I'm talking about today. But even, even in these, these forecasts, they're telling us how you're going to weather through it till it gets better. Even in, in the prophecies of what they're saying, they cannot believe what the Bible has predicted. And so they're luring even the wisest of investors into a false sense of security and saying, it can't happen here. <clears throat> The normalcy bias. Let me explain what I mean by that. The normalcy bias refers to an extreme mental state people enter when facing a disaster. How many times have we been through, it's like, man, I can't believe this. We've all said that before. I can't believe this. It's like the mind wants to deny what the eyes are seeing. It's called the normalcy bias. It causes people to underestimate both the possibility of a disaster occurring and its possible effects. So when you look at the future, you look at the events that have taken place, you look at the Bible, everyone looks at that in this world and says, it can't happen here. In their minds, they're thinking it's going to be somewhere else that this is going to take place. This often results in situations where people fail to adequately Prepare for disaster. Fail to adequately prepare for disaster. Now, if you live in, an, uh, in a, 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 a location that's prone to disaster, like hurricanes, people who live along the coast, or if you live in the Midwest with tornadoes and you don't have a cellar, and you don't prepare properly, it's going to be to your peril. People today in this country are not preparing for what's coming. 
Because in their mind, it can't happen. They have looked to the government as a God who are going to get them through all the circumstances that we're facing. In fact, today, when anything happens, what did they do? They looked to Washington, and Washington says to say, okay, we're going to get us out of this. And that's what's been going on for quite a, quite a long time. The assumption is made that in the case of the normal bias, normalcy bias, is that since a disaster has never occurred, it will never occur. So since the United States has never gone through the fault, we've never had that kind of a problem, it's never going to happen. Or are we going to get through it? It then causes people to drastically underestimate the effects of the disaster. Now I talk to people in, in the church, in the various churches around, and I know one man who's done real well with his life. He's, he's been uh, faithful to God. And he's been faithful to do what he's supposed to economically. He's got lots and lots of rental property. And he was having a hard time renting houses recently. And I said, well, it's, it's going to come. And we went through a, a series of communications, and I finally got down to the point and said, don't you understand? God said when this finally is over, 10% of mankind is going to be left alive. Do you honestly think you're going to continue to rent homes or apartments? And so even in our minds, even within the church, even within knowing the truth, the mind cannot fathom the depth of what's coming. And you can prepare, and you can put aside, and by all means you should. You should be preparing for the disaster because you will do better if you do. And I don't mean don't do nothing. In fact, I've heard another person say, don't do anything. Don't even store a can of food. Just live by faith. I said, wait a minute. The Bible shows us how we prepare for disaster. This, uh, you, you read all these things, and even within the church, it's not fathomable what is going to actually happen. Because in our minds, we have done everything we're supposed to, so we're, we're going to be saved. Some churches still say that you're going to be going, taken somewhere to a place of safety. During it all, when it's finished, you'll be brought back. While the same churches preach against the rapture. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to all this. It's like, this is crazy. All right, so let's go on with this normal, normalcy bias. <clears throat> Jeremiah says this. Why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? And you look around our nation, it seems like that's what we're going through right now. <clears throat> they hold fast to deceit and they refuse to return. Now, we look at our nation, it's, when you look at the news, it's filled with deceit of what's going on and refuse to turn to God. He goes on to say in verse 6, says, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repents of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Now, if you talk to somebody in, in, in general Joe Blow public, and you talk about this nation needs to repent, and they need to repent, they will come back and say, what have I done? Because in the, in the world's condition, it's okay to be immoral. It's okay to do whatever it is that's right in your mind because that's the acceptable way of behavior. In fact, if you try to follow God's way, you're the one who has the problem now. It has completely come full circle. It's 180 degrees from what's right to wrong and wrong is right. We are at that stage now. The Bible prophesies that it was come. If you look over the last 30 years, you will see the gradual shift from the 60s. So I guess it's 40 years or 50 years now, is when, the, when the change began is to change what's right to wrong. And now it has become full circle. And you will see in the years to come that you will be attacked for holding fast to the truth. And that's coming. But that's another story. It can't happen here. We've been through this before. We're a good and just people. You talk to most people in the street, they'll tell you I'm a good person. You know, I don't, I don't, go out and beat people. I don't go out and rape. I don't go out and steal. I don't do armed robbery. I'm a good person. And they believe that without understanding what God judges as good and bad, or right and wrong, or good and evil. <clears throat> I like this one. I'm fine. Everyone else has the problem. <laughs> you ever talk to somebody and look at you and say, hey, what's wrong with you? You think that you're the one who's got the problem. 
we have done this all our lives, nothing is going to happen. Those are just a few of the excuses. If you sat in a round table, I'm sure you can come up with a whole lot more of why God's word isn't going to come to pass. And these are reasons that people will use that I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. The Bible warnings and the stage to collapse. That's coming. Remember, the, remember these scriptures. We've been using them for the last few years. Let me bring them in as a reminder because the duality of coming out of captivity in the Bible is unmistakable. There's never been enough emphasis to show the duality of going into captivity and the things that take place. And you just don't wake up one day and you, you wake up and say, okay, there's somebody at your door and all of a sudden this nation is held as a hostage state. It don't work that way. It shows that God is going to gradually, just like he did Israel, just like he did with, uh, with the warning to Joseph, will gradually bring us to ruin for a series of steps. And Genesis 42, 1 says this. Now when jo Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there was corn in Egypt. Get you down there and buy for us from thence that we may live and die not. This is following the seven years of plenty and the seven years of lean. One chapter later, which was about the next year, when you go through the Bible, you can, you can pinpoint this. Genesis 43 says, and the famine was sore in the land. And if, I'm, if I remember correctly, I believe this is about the third year in the famine. It wasn't very long into the famine. When you have an agricultural society, the agrarian, there's not a lot of store. If you didn't prepare for that seven years, what happens is you use up your supply on the premise is that we've been through this before, we've seen this, it's going to be okay, Next year is going to be better. Now, don't we hear that from the people in the news? All the talking heads and all the governments, and you're going to hear it from the governments, I'm telling you. Don't listen to what they're saying. Listen to the fruits of what's going on. Because you've got, what, 60, 80 brand new congressmen coming in. They're going to come in with certain things on their mind and certain agendas. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes why most of them cannot be accomplished without shutting down this country. No, doesn't matter how good intentions they have. Doesn't matter what they were voted in the office to do. The reality is, it won't happen. Except for a little bit. And it came to pass, they said, when they had eaten up the corn which they bought out of Egypt, the father said, go again and buy us a little food. The tone of the voice and the way it's worded here, you're seeing that they're just about out of reserve. They're running to the end of their reserve. And what is happening when the end of this reserve is God shows that they're moving into Egypt. The United States is running to the end of its reserve. In fact, it's been there for quite some time. And it's grabbing money and doing, and I'm going to show you all this in just a few minutes. I wanted to set the stage here because of how things work, because it's biblically prophesied that what we're, what we're looking at now that's coming is identical to what we've seen in the Old Testament. And it's going to happen again. <clears throat> How many people remember looking at the Depression era pictures? Remember seeing some of those? I mean, they're, they're, they're vivid uh, back during the, the late 20s when the collapse came, and we've seen that all through the, the early and the mid 30s. Remember those pictures? How about food lines? Remember the unemployment lines, the food lines? Remember all that? Bobby was talking about that. Remember that in your prayers. But now I want to show you something here. I want you to pay attention to these pictures when I click this next button. Watch what happens. All right, the Depression era is coming again. Now watch. You notice the pictures change in the color on the bottom too? The two bottom pictures you were looking at are today. That wasn't the past. That is happening right now around our country, and the news is not talking about it. Well, you've seen that I simply just put a black and white film over and then let it go back to the real color is today. There are 10 cities that are popping up all around the country. Now, I don't know if the world is aware of this. I don't know if most people in the United States are aware of this. But it's happening right now and is an ugly truth 
that this world doesn't want to look at. Now, let me, I'm going to talk about the conditions right now. Let's talk about the hard times. These are current pictures from last year, because we're now in 2011. <laughs> Yesterday was last year. These are just a couple months old, these pictures. Hard times and tent cities are raising up all across this country. If you have a home and you have a job, boy, be thankful to God you do at this particular time. I work with Chris and with Gilbert here, with me in the business that we work on during the year, during the week. And I call them together in the middle of the week, and they will tell you this is true. I said, whatever work we get from this day forth, we better be thankful before God, because it's only by His grace that we're going to have any work to maintain going forward. I said, I would hate to be someone out in this world and not have God to rely on. Because if you're going to try to be out there and make it on your own, Satan and his demons are going to gobble you up. And I'm telling everybody today, 2011, January 1st, please make sure you're focused on God for your, for your salvation. Because it's going to get really tough going forward. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get and how many people I talk to who have, who have economic difficulties right now, whose health is in bad shape. And the only way they're going right now is through the government subsidizing certain things in their life to keep them going. When that runs out, and we're going to begin to see that running out in the very near future, we're going to see something that this world cannot see. It's called the normalcy bias. I can't believe what I'm seeing. It can't happen here. They will see it, and it will be real, and there will be a denial. And the news won't want to talk about it. The news is going to focus on things to give us encouragement. The Congress is not going to talk about it because they're going to be looking at ways to keep them going. And sure, you got 80 new people going in, or 70 new people, whatever it was, who got in office, who spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to get them there. Now, who are they going to support? They're going to have to pay back those who finance their campaigns. And that's why every time you see we're going to cut back, when they put in hundreds of billions of dollars of appropriation to projects that, are, that nobody knows anything about because they've got to pay back those who gave them the money. Follow the money and you will find out what the truth is. It's called Babylon. God says come out of her. And Babylon is going to fall. We need to keep that in mind. Now, Ellen Basick, an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the president of the National Center of Family for Homelessness, writes this. A national study released in 2008 finds that one in 50 children in America is homeless. Are you aware of that? We talked about the other nations around the world and what's going on within our borders. One in 50 children in America are homeless. They're either sharing housing because of economic hardships, or they're with a family member, or some family took them in with their family, maybe with their mom and their dad. Maybe it's because they had to go back to the grandparents, and we're seeing tons and tons of that, because the mom and dad can't take care of them no more, or they just abandon them. Because of economic hardships, living in motels, cars, Abandoned buildings, parks, campgrounds, or shelters are waiting for foster care placement. Now, this is the lady who runs the National Center for Family Homelessness. Now, look at what she says here. Normal, normal, normalcy bias. That is something I don't think people intuitively believe to be true. If you told people in the street that one in 50 kids are homeless in America, they said that ain't true. They won't believe you. This lady runs the center who documents all this, and she's telling you it's true. Not a word on the news about this. More and more Americans are now defaulting. Almost 60% of all American homes are now on some type of government support. 60%. At the feast, I reported according to the U.S. debt clock, that there were 42 million homes on food stamps. Two days ago, when I began working on this sermon, I looked at the debt clock. It's now over 43 million homes. 
another million people, a million homes, have now gone on food stamps since the feast. This is according to actual government figures. And that was, it was interesting. If you go back to U.S. Debt Clock and you look at the side for bankruptcies and, and people on food stamps, I watched it turn. And while I was sitting there doing this work for, the, for a couple of hours, another couple hundred people were added to the food stamp blanks while I was working on this message. Now keep in mind, this is all being government funded. And keep in mind, follow the money, what happens when it runs out? What are you looking at here with 43 million homes who begin to have cutbacks or have their food stopped? Can't happen here. Right? That's what we're told. Now, we've been through this before. According to Moody's Analytics, a wing of Moody's Corporation, 2010 is expected to end with 1.8 million foreclosures in total. A million and eight, 1.8, just under 2 million people will have bankruptcy foreclosures this year. Now, it's already been recorded. That was on the books yesterday when I looked at the, the debt clock, because they record that too. It was right at 1.7 million, just under that. But all the, all the paperwork hasn't been through yet. In 2011, it's expected to swell to 2.1 million people to file bankruptcy. This is on top of each year that this is going on. And if I listened to the news correctly yesterday, we're in pretty good shape now. We're getting much better. Stock market's rising. Spending's going on. In fact, many people in stores are recording record sales for Christmas. Record sales. They didn't tell you that the record sales was because of the charges on the credit account. It wasn't money. Most of it was charged. Why? Because the news told them next year is going to get better. So they're going on the basis of what they were just told, that things are going to get better. I can go ahead and risk, spend a little bit. I'll get my debt up there because the job situation is going to be okay. Now, does that sound right? Unemployment continues at 10%. Now, Bobby said that he thought it was around 17%. It was actual unemployment. According to true government statistics, it's just over 21% of actual unemployment. Now, how does that figure? This is interesting, these, these funny numbers, the way, the, the way we're told things. Back during the Dust Bowl, back during the, uh, the Depression era, the actual unemployment figures were actual people who are out of work. Today, you know where they figured out the unemployment? It's how many people are receiving unemployment benefits. That's how many people are out of work. Well, that's interesting the way that works. If you've been out of work for the last two years, well, the government's extended it, they've extended it. Well, you eventually, even with the extensions, reach the point, if you haven't found a job yet, you're no longer getting any more benefits. According to government figures, you're no longer out of work. You're no longer unemployed. Because you don't get any benefits. You're not unemployed. So well, that's interesting. So all these people who haven't had jobs, all the bankruptcies, and all the people living on the places and under bridges who don't get any benefits, because if you don't have an address, you're not getting benefits. All these people are no longer unemployed, according to government figures. Now, that's the reality of what's going on right now. So when they tell you it's, uh, unemployment is not, not bad, it's 9.8%, we're doing pretty good. And just yesterday, or I'm sorry, just Thursday, everybody was excited because unemployment dropped to just under 400,000 new, new claims. Well, that's great. It just dropped. That's because people are not looking for jobs. If you balance out how many jobs were created versus how many dropped, you will find out the difference is, is that the people are no longer getting their benefits. And that's why it dropped. Not because it's doing better, it's because they're not showing up for work anymore. Because in one city alone, they hit one job was advertised, this was on the news. It was one job paying $15 an hour plus benefits. 700 people applied for the job. That's tough competition. Debt continues to escalate. 
Look what Jeremiah 9 says. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. So we listen to the news, we listen to the government. What are they telling us? They are not valid for the truth on the earth, and they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. That's what we're looking at. When you can turn on the TV and they're telling you how much, how much better things are, they're going from lie to lie and from evil to evil. Bankruptcies, as I just showed you a few minutes ago, are going to continue to rise. Pharaoh's dream. Let's talk about this for just a second because it's good. We've got we to gotta bring this to reality. <clears throat> in a second. I caught a little cold this week, so my chest is a little blocked up. Pharaoh's dream. We know the story, but let's go through it because we need this as a reminder. So it came to pass at the end of two full years that the Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. And suddenly there came out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, and Pharaoh awoke. Now, you, we know the story. This was, the, this was when Joseph was brought to Pharaoh. I'm going to go ahead and put through here because he has a second dream, pretty much saying the same thing. And we know from Scripture that any time God reinforces it a second time, it's for effect and for a special emphasis. So what we're looking at here is that in these two dreams, they're saying the same thing. Is that there were seven years of plenty, and then there's seven years of lean. I believe the United States is way past the seven years of plenty. I can't tell you when it exactly stopped or how, but if you were looking at 2001, you would have thought it happened started then as far as the seven years of lean, but it didn't. If we look at seven years later, 2007, we began to see the economic collapse taking place. It is possible that at 2007, we can look back and say, well, you know, that's when the economic of the seven years of lean began. Because for those other seven years from 2000 to 2007, we've seen this continual growth it can continue a consumption of goods in the rise in debt. And things look pretty good for those years for a lot of people. So that's what we're looking at with the dream. And so we're in somewhere in this position of leading us into times of lean, Jacob's trouble. All this has to take place before an event that's going to come up, and I'm going to tell you about in just a few minutes. Jeremiah 30 says, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back captivity, from captivity, my people of Israel and Judah, says the Lord. So that tells us, before Christ returns, that his people, Israel and Judah, are going to be going into captivity if he's going to get them out. So somewhere, just like with the Old Testament, is that the seven years of lean and plenty, is that the rest of the world, while we were living lavishly on debt, the rest of the world was beginning to prepare itself for the collapse. Anyone with half a brain in economics could look at what we were doing and realize you can't spend your way out of debt. In 2007 was the peak years for, for um, China in our debt. It leveled off by 2009, began dropping of how much of our debt. The rest of the world is doing the same thing. They're beginning to divest themselves of its dependency on the American dollar. It says, now, ask and see, it says, whether a man is in labor with the child. He's looking at, the, at this scenario. He's asking uh, uh, Jeremiah, look at these people, all these men, they're, they're bent over like a woman having pains of birth. He says, man doesn't have birth pains, so what are they doing? He says, they look like a woman in labor, and all their faces have turned pale. The reality is setting in, and is going to set in for this nation. And they will say, the normal subbias can't happen here. We're going to be okay. It says, for alas, that day is great, and there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, through it all, you and I understand that God will protect his people. There will be a time of some martyrdom, but for most of God's people, that's not going to happen. But it doesn't mean you're going to go through this unscathed. Jacob and his brothers didn't go through it unscathed. Well... Jacob went through, the, the, cap, the, through uh, the captivity eventually, and he eventually became the second in command. He eventually brought his, his father down with Joseph and with his son. 
and they got through it. But in the meantime, they suffered. Eventually what happened, it led them to a captive state. That is what we're going to see in this nation. Whether we want to accept it or not, it's going to happen. Like in Egypt before Exodus, economic ruin. God will bring about economic ruin. We don't see it all yet. We're beginning to see glimpses of it here and there, and the news media is not covering it. They're putting it on the side, and they're putting it on the back burner. Revelation 11.3 says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for a thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These have the power to shut up heaven that it did not rain. It falls in the days of their prophecy, and that they have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So for three and a half years, there's not going to be any rain. That means this entire world is going to be affected. Kings says this, 1 Kings 17, it's, it's a type. And Elijah, the Tishbite, and the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, for whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And we know for three and a half years that he prophesied there was no rain. Jesus Christ says when he talks to us in the New Testament, Behold, says, I will send Elijah before my coming. And these two witnesses are a type of Elijah that is going to come in and do the exact same thing that Elijah did and called no rain down. And there was a severe famine and economic hardship was driving. When these two witnesses are out there who are proclaiming God's holy word, they're going to be looking for those who back those people up because they're going to blame us for the, the, the damage of what's going on. And we will know the truth. The economic ruin. The more cities today. Now, listen, now I don't know... How many people understand this? There are more cities in the United States that faced bankruptcy in 2011. According to this report, this is through the Business Insider, there are at least 16 cities in the United States that will have to declare bankruptcy if they cannot find new revenues and not make the deep spending cuts. That means the benefits and those who work for that city and those states are going to have to cut back. That means adding to more unemployment which falls into the government of the federal level to help support those people that they're cutting back on because of the default. It also means that there's many of these cities that are not going to be able to cut back enough. California may be one of those states. So the government's going to have to step in and give them a handout to keep them going. And they don't have the money now. According to the Center of Budget Priorities out of Washington, it says that 46 states face huge budget shortfalls for 2011, and many of those have not paid their debt yet of 2010. Now, this is, this is happening. Remember the seven years of lean, gradually sucking all the reserves out? Several states also face the same fate. Additional millions of Americans have filed on high bankruptcies that are being forced to rely on government for aid. Now, this is according to this Washington think tank on the budget priorities in America. U.S. continues to, to mount its debt, economic ruin. U.S. is running in vast annual budget deficits that by some methods of calculation may be as high as $5 trillion a year. Now, that's unthinkable. That, that's, that's not real. And they say, oh, no, the, the budget deficit is only 1.3. I think they moved it to 1.4 just the other day, $1.4 trillion. But if you accept all the other debt that they're assuming, that they say they're going to guarantee, they're saying that the acceptance of that debt could be as high as five trillion dollars a year right now. The official gross U.S. debt has reached pro uh, uh, roughly three point six trillion dollars. Now, this was just a couple months ago. It's actually higher than that right now. It's getting closer to fourteen trillion because see, they they got they got a ceiling, and they're going to have to meet to raise that ceiling. But when one adds up the unfunded liabilities of Medicare. Social Security, Medicaid, and all the other liabilities such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the total may be somewhere around $59 trillion that the United States actually has in debt it needs to pay. There's no way this country can pay that back. Those are not the funny figures. Those are real figures. And some of unofficial reports or official reports claim it could be as high as $200 trillion when you put it all together. And it's so big and there's so much out there, they really can't get a good grasp on it. Minimum that they know of is somewhere around $59 trillion that they have accepted liability for. When all these debts that took place in the last three years, they just all went away? Where do you think they went to? The federal government absorbed them in the U.S. Treasury. 
the rest of the world understands that's what's going on. We reported in the last quarterly on page 11. I'm going to bring this up in just a second to show you what we reported. Timothy Geithner wrote the following. I saw this. It was a little hard to read, so I, I put it on a separate page coming up. On October 18, 2010, less than a month ago, Timothy Geithner openly stated that the feds would not do what they just did. It's amazing. When do you know the government's going to do something? Right after they deny they're going to do it. You can normally say, right after they go public and say, we're not going to do that, they're about to do that. Why? Because they have to stop the panic until they have everything in place, and then they do what they need to do. If you knew tomorrow that the banks are going to be beginning to default by Monday evening, all right, so Monday evening the banks are going to default, Monday morning you're going to be in that bank getting your money out. Right? So what do they have to do is say, oh, we're just fine. When the company gets bought out by another company, they will call all the employees together, because I've been through this twice. They call everybody together, and what is the first thing to do? Everybody's going to have a job, don't worry. A month later, two months later, when they come in, the new company takes over, and there's the pink slips going out. Because they need you during the transition. It's not about you. It's about keeping them going, and that's what the government does. All right? He went on to say this. This, this is following, this is quoted from that interview. It's not going to happen in this country. Remember that? Can't happen here. We're talking about the devaluation of the dollar. All right? So he said this to a group of business leaders in the Silicon Valley. He went on to say that it's important for people to understand that the United States of America and no country around the world can devalue its way to prosperity to be competitive. Geithner went on to add, it is not a viable, feasible strategy, and we will not engage in it. He said that in October. He asked if the dollar would lose the status as the world's res uh, reserve currency. The Treasury's chief said, not in our lifetime. Well, that was interesting. Just one month later, the feds did just that. One month later, they announced what's called QE2. They call it quantitative easing. It's a way of absorbing debt. Now, how do they absorb debt? They didn't devaluate the dollar because they couldn't do that around the world because the rest of the world wasn't going to stand for it. So what did they do? They created a new program to create $600 million. How did they create it? Well, they go and they print it. They just print it up to go pay to buy the debt that the government can't pay for. So they went through a devaluation of the dollar through a buyback program of debt. And they're going to spend so much money per month up until the summer until they reach $600 million. $600 million. Now, that's not going to be enough. You'll be coming back, and you'll be surprised if you don't see it rise over a trillion dollars because that's the very minimum they need just to get by right now. Most believe that this is just the beginning. And so with all that debt, what's keeping America afloat? I mean, if, if you owe so much money and you only got so much coming in, your debt, your people you owe money to, they, they reach the point where they say, look, pay up now, I'm coming to take it away, right? Well, they shut you down. We keep raising our debt and printing money. That's the only thing that's keeping the United States afloat right now. It's that simple. Raising our debt and printing money. Because we're not producing enough to keep us afloat. The United States quit being a producing country many years ago. We are a consuming nation. We consume everything and create debt. We don't produce enough to get us out to, to, to benefit this nation. The dollar right now is the standard and the world's currency. Now, Timothy Geithner said, would the, would the dollar cease to be the currency, the world's standard? And he said, not in our lifetime. I'm going to show you a video in just a second. Let me just give you one example for oil and see how things are going to change our lives. Right now, the primary receiver of oil is paid for in dollars. So if we need to buy oil or we need to pay for debt, we simply go to the back room, we print some more dollars, and we go out and say, okay, give us some more oil. Germany can't do that. Uh, Europe can't do that. What they have to do is this. They have to take their currency, trade it to U.S. dollars, and then go buy oil. Now, that's the primary way that things are being accepted. Now, I know they go through banks, and they go through the foreign exchange and the central banks, and I know it's a complicated way. But the bottom line, when it finally comes down to paying it off, 
is based on the U.S. dollar. Now, the U.S. dollar, if we don't have enough and it starts using other currencies and we can't buy the oil, immediately the price of oil rises. We can't afford to buy it, so we have to go print more money. So if, let's say we have $10 and we need 20 So we go print $10, now we got 20 right? It still buys half the oil. It only gets half because the dollars have got more dollars, but its value doesn't change. The value stays the same. Your dollar's only worth so much money. I don't care how many you give me. If you print more, you're still going to get the same for the amount of value of the dollar. So if you print twice as much, the value is one half. So you see it doesn't help. As long as the dollar values the oil against the dollar, they accept that as the currency standard, when it doesn't change. So then what happens if they change it? Well, our standard of living now changes because everything just went up. And you're seeing it right now in commodities. Cotton has risen 100% this past year, and most of it has been in the last four months. When? Since we began QE2. Because you can't keep printing money because the value drops and it doesn't have the same worth. Soybeans have been going up. And so you're going to begin to see a cost of everything escalating because we keep putting the dollar by trying to absorb the debt. America in default. In 2010, the debt ceiling was raised from $2.7 trillion to $14.3 trillion. We're just under $14 trillion right now. In less than two or three months, we will be at that ceiling. The new Congress coming in, they're going to have to face a couple of issues. U.S. debt now just $400 billion under the ceiling of $14.3 trillion. We will reach that in just a few months, our ceiling. The Congress will be forced to raise that limit or shut down the government. What, how do they raise the limit? Well, they just go print more money. They'll say, okay, now, our limit was 14.3, now let's go to $16 trillion. Now, they just raised that ceiling last year, and they're going to have to raise it again. What does that mean? Things are going to begin to happen this year. One, they're going to be forced to raise the debt ceiling. Now, I, I don't care what they tell you. They're going to have to raise the debt ceiling because they can't stop it. They cannot stop the interest rate on the debt from rising. We can't produce enough goods. I will tell you a fact. If we took 100% of everyone's salary in the, in the United States, 100%, Hundred percent, we can't pay for the budget for one year. You can't pay for it. That's a fact. Those are fig those are real figures. Now, if we pay for the budget alone, we're one point three trillion dollars over budget. So we've got to come up with everything they're spending plus one point three trillion plus the interest on this debt that rises about hundred and twenty million dollars every hour. $120 million is the minimum every hour that that interest is raised. That's incredible. So they're going to have to be forced to raise the ceiling. No matter what they tell you, they'll have to find a compromise to raise it. Because they're going in and saying, we're not raising the debt. They can't stop it. They'll be forced to begin cutbacks to the welfare recipients. So that means as the debt continues to rise and they fight what they're going to do, they're going to have to have a compromise. The compromises will begin cutting back. You might begin to see them raid Social Security again. You might begin to see them cut back Medicare and Medicaid. And they will begin to find ways to cut back as they continue to raise the debt. Because all the cutbacks cannot stop the debt rise. We need to get that on our head. That's a reality. Don't let it be a normalcy bias that you ever forget. They can't create enough money to stop the debt. The rest of the world knows it, and they're separating themselves from us. The devalued dollar is the one world currency. On March 24, 2009, this is a year ago. You haven't heard much about it in 2010, but it's still on the books. Reuters reported that President Barack Obama on his two economic officials on Tuesday dismissed suggestions by the emerging economic powers that the world move away from the U.S. dollar as the world's main currency. He denied that that's what's going on. He says... I don't believe that there's a need for global currency. He says this openly. I don't believe there is. Now look at this date, March 24th. There's no need for a global currency, he told in a primetime television news conference, adding that the dollar is the extraordinarily strong right now. 
Two days later, March 26, in a trial balloon sent out by the Fed Treasurer, Tim Geithner says, Tim Geithner shocked global markets two days later now, revealing that Washington is quite open to the Chinese proposals for the gradual development of a global reserve currency by the International Monetary Fund. When do you see they're going to begin to do it? Right after they denied they're going to do it. They had to begin to do this because it was 2009 that the leveling off stopped and it began to drop for China buying our debt. Do you remember me talking about a time when, when, when they went up for bond sales and nobody was buying them? Remember China come back in and says, they'll say, okay, we'll buy at the last minute to stop what was about to happen because they wasn't in a position yet to go without the losses of the United States. They will be in the very near future. And they will cut their losses at so many hundreds of billions of dollars and they will take it as a loss and move on because they know the longer they stay, the worse it's going to get. They're not there yet, but they're moving the currencies around and getting in position so that that time will happen. Immediately after that announcement, the dollar plunged instantly against the euro. When, the United, when this world gets away from the dollar currency as the standard, which everything is built around, this world would begin to start its collapse. Remember it says Babylon fell in one day. We're beginning to see this tightrope and this twine being tighter and tighter and tighter as it goes. And you're going to see it fall in one day in the near future. And you're going to see that continual drain. And you're going to see the continual weakness in the United States and Jacob's trouble set, set in place. It began to fall immediately. The mere fact, it says, that the U.S. Treasury is even entertaining the thought of the dollar may cease to be the anchor of the, of the global monetary system is called consternation, he said. Just the thought of it set the world into a tailspin. Hmm. He asked if the dollar will lose the status if the world's recur uh, reserve currency. The Treasury chief said, not in our lifetime. Well, watch this video. This was back in 2009. It's about three minutes long. The U.S. dollar's dominant role in world trade could soon be over. A British newspaper report says China, Russia, Japan, and Gulf states are planning to stop using the American currency in oil trading. Some experts are predicting an economic war between the U.S. and China over Middle East oil. Stacey Bivens has the details. An economic cobble may be in the works to replace the U.S. dollar on the world stage. That's as uncertainty over the U.S. economy continues to dog Wall Street and raise questions about the future of the currency. Until we get a change in the politics in the U.S. Uh, and the, the budget politics, uh, the dollar should be under pressure. According to the U.K.'s independent newspaper, Brazil, China, Russia, and Gulf states are meeting secretly with the hope of freeing themselves from that pressure by ditching the dollar for oil trading. The nations would instead opt to use various other currency, including a regional one, to be used in Gulf states. It's only better for the central banks uh, and only better for you know, entrepreneurs, I think, in the end, if uh, there's a wider array of currencies from which they can choose from. But Saudi Arabia has swiftly denied any secret talks, and in fact, the dollar strengthened slightly as denial spread. There is probably going to be a lot of pressure behind the curtains uh, by the United States on Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states. And let us not forget that, uh, that it is the United States does not only afford protection to, to these countries, uh, it's also a key player in the, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation. What has not been secret is the desire of the G20 to move from under the dollar's dominance. Back in April, G20 members called for an alternative currency. The idea is based on what the IMF uses to rival the dollar. The financial crisis in the United States has proven how dependent the world is on one currency as economic instability spread. The downturn soured emerging markets on the dollar and caused more speculation about the possibility of diversifying reserves. That's a tricky proposition, though, for Japan, China, and Russia, who hold hundreds of billions of U.S. currency in reserves and who would lose its value if the dollar is demoted. The U.S. dollar may be weak, but American influence is not. Washington is sure to use all of its resources to try to block the expulsion of the dollar from the global stage. But how long the U.S. can fend off calls for a new global currency depends on how strong and how fast the dollar can rebound and how loud and how frequent there are calls for a new currency leader.
Russia's northern capital, St. Petersburg, favors trading oil and gas in rubles. And at a summit in the U.S. recently, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev supported the idea of regional currency. This idea is becoming more and more evident now. However, there is still a long way to go before the introduction of regional currencies. For example, the introduction of the ruble as a regional currency. Late last month, Iran announced that its foreign currency reserves will be held in euros from now on instead of dollars. While nations publicly deny a plan to oust the dollar, it may not be enough to quell speculation. Stacy Bed. Expect that that will change within the next eight years. They expect that the dollar will no longer be the central currency within the next eight years. This was in 2009. I found what's interesting is if it, the eight years is that when we've done the pro prophecy uh, sermons, there's many things pointing to 2017, 2018, and 2019. Is that this is another thing that looks like is going to come up past within that same period. So we're looking at an escalation of tension from many ways in many areas that's going to happen somewhere within that 2015 to 2020, and we need to be prepared and ready for that. Three things to watch for in the future, that the U.S. will no longer be the world reserve currency. It's stated in the video within the next nine years. Oil will no longer be priced in dollars. That could take place a lot sooner than nine years. That doesn't have to take nine years. That could happen a lot sooner. The euro or a multi foam currency or a basket of currencies will become the standard. And that's within the next nine years. Any one of these will throw America into a decline that it cannot recover from because it removes the only means America has for its continual expanse of debt, and that is the printing of its dollar to pay for it. Because they'll no longer be accepted because you can print as much as you want. And what you will see is the hyperinflation of, of cost for goods. So even if the dollar is strong, what it buys is weak. Your dollar no longer buys what it used to buy. In simple terms, take out all the complicity of everything I've told you in this sermon. The bottom line is this. The dollar may have a strong value against other currencies, and they need it that way because, see, they hold the dollar. If the dollar goes down, so does what they hold. If, for example, if, if China owes $500 billion of dollars, and the dollar, it drops in half, now their value is only $250, $250 million. So it drops. So the currencies try to keep it pegged to the dollar so they don't lose out. But the bottom line is the dollar no longer buys what it used to buy. That's why oil keeps rising. <coughs> and we will continue to hear it can't happen here, the normalcy bias. America is going to be abandoned by the rest of the world during this calamity. This, uh, calamity. Jeremiah 34, 12 says, For thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. It's incurable. So when I tell you what's coming, you can't get out of it, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not somebody just being out there on a limb. I'm going to God's holy word and God's holy word who's prophesying this is end time, Jacob's trouble. God's saying it's incurable. I feel pretty safe ground when I'm saying the United States cannot get itself out of this mess. And that's because, the, because God's Word says so. It's incurable. But we need to understand that. It says there's no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up and you have no healing medicines. The government's going to reach the point it can't save the people like everybody thinks it can. All your lovers have forgotten you. All these other countries are living lavishly off the dollar right now, off of us giving them hundreds of millions and trillions of dollars and keeping them going. It says, they all forgot you, it says. So they do not seek you, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy and with chastisement of a cruel one for the multitude of your iniquities because your sins have increased. We're going to create the shift of global economic power the fall of modern-day Joseph in Israel is the time of Jacob's trouble, and that's coming. And that's going to precede and lead into the, uh, uh, the tribulation, the three and a half years of tribulation. It is the establishment of a modern-day king in the north that's found in Daniel 11, whereas Antiochus Epiphanes fulfilled the role of the king in the north were Greco-Romans. And we can look at a modern-day Greco-Roman, and that's why we believe it is going to be modern-day Europe who's going to be head through 
who the Assyrians, who was the rod of God's, of God's anger against Israel, we believe it's going to happen again, whose base power for most, if not all, was them, was in Europe. You'll see an establishment of modern-day king of the south. It says, And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push against him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and they shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and overpass them. So we're going to begin to see all of these things. The events that we're seeing today, and why I go through all of these things today? To show you that these events have to take place for fulfillment of prophecy to come to pass. That when the United States is moved out of its position, when the dollar is no longer the value of the rest of the world, when they no longer need us, because they're almost at that stage right now, they're going to cut their losses, and they're going to have global problems as they may try to jockey for position of who's going to be the most powerful. We will see rise up within those king of the north and king of the south, that man, the great one of the evil, stand in, is going to come in, just like a time of Epiphanes, who came in with flatteries. King of the North and King of the South, both of the modern day powers are rising fast on the world scene. The events that are taking place are before our very eyes right now. And this clash will shake the world as never before and will lead into World War III. Now it can't happen here. That won't ever happen. Here. The normalcy bias will not accept what's coming. The stories I'm giving you today are real. They're facts based on truth. I could tell the world, and you're going to tell the world, and they're going to listen and say, nah, I don't believe that. And they're going to listen to the people on the TV who's going to tell them the great things and how wonderful we're doing. I've got a map here. I'm going to show you something, because I'm going to leave off with this in just a second, because I want to do part two. You know what I'm, I'm going to talk about part two? is I want to talk into the duality of the king of the north and the king of the south. And I want to bring those things into play the next time I give a message, which is going to be in three weeks. The show about the king of the north, the king of the south, how the economics are playing into this role, and who the possible players are. And I do say possible because we can be wrong. But from, from what we're looking at, and what is shaping up, and what we've understood, it appears to be true what's taking place. Daniel 11.40 says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. The king of the south is believed to be somewhere within this region, because we're talking about from a Jerusalem point of south. It could be a number of nations. It could be one or two of the south. But what I believe is going to happen, I believe what's going to take place is we're going to see a coalition of these oil countries come together with two primary focuses. The first being oil, undermined by the reality of the truth, which is the Muslim people. In other words, a false god. And we'll say that these kings of the south it could be as far as this. It could take in Iran. It could take in Pakistan. There's, we don't really know. We just know that uh, in the south would be those who are against Israel. It goes on to say the king in the north. Now, as far as we understand, somewhere within these nations in Europe, we will find the king in the north rising. Because if duality is true, we're going to have to see a modern-day Assyria. The adult modern-day Assyria who plagued Israel for a hundred years. If we look at modern day Assyria, which we believe to be Germany, who migrated from where they were to where they are now, the Assyrians, which are modern day Germany, for almost 100 years from World War I, World War II, we're seeing them rise again in duality, who are going to be heading up Europe because they're the only stronghold in Europe right now. And they're the only ones who can stand up to China. And we have that, road, that scenario coming in, coming out of the east, coming in to affect these, this scenario of the king in the north and king in the south. And you'll see the king in the south, it says, begin to push against the king in the north. Now, even though they may have more money than the north, they don't have the power base, and they don't have the supply. And the next thing it says, the king in the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, and with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, who do you think is controlling the majority of the waters in the Mediterranean right now? Germany. They are the primary focus of the leaders who are patrolling the waters of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. It says they're going to come against them with, with many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them. And that's why I believe, now some churches are teaching as one nation is the king of the south, I believe it's going to be several of the nations of the South who are coming together because it says plural here, countries. 
He shall enter into the countries and overwhelm them and pass through them in their march into where the Bible talks about coming together at Jerusalem where many armies shall be surrounded. Now I want to talk about that next time in more specifics. And you'll begin to see the king of the north begin to push back against the king of the south, it says, and shall overrun them. The events to take place this year will play a major role in prophetic fulfillment. We're going to begin to see that on the economic front as the United States tries to find its way out of debt. In part two of the normalcy bias, I'll cover the king of the north and the kings of the south and show the parallels of dualities of what to look for in the future. In the meantime, I want to close with something to think about. Just relax. This is about a, about a two-minute video here about your dash in your life and what God's been calling you to do. It's not what you. It's not how much you have or what you owe or what you earn or what you or what you have. It's about how you. Live your life like this little movie says, The Dash. that video a couple years ago. I thought it was appropriate here because you see between now and the return of Christ, we have a dash. It's a short time. And God's going to judge us how well we go through that dash. If you've had troubles in the past, if you've not been able to get your life together, get your act together, go before God on this day, put it behind you, ask for forgiveness, and focus now on what's ahead. Because if you can't focus on what's ahead, you can be doomed to repeat your past. In your dash, you're not going to make it. Turn, go to God and clear the past up and be ready. And I'm going to talk about what's coming with the king of the north and king of the, and those scenarios in two weeks.